risk disclosures comparative analysis. Before we begin, I'd like to make you aware of some upcoming PRM events that may be of interest to you. This Thursday, we have our exploring the mind, uh, exploring the power of mindfulness seminars. On all Fridays, we have our coding for risk management seminars. On Saturdays, we have both our IQRM and introduction to finance seminars. On November 11th, we have our next CRO Spotlight series featuring Kaishi Hatsuki, Chief Risk Officer of Morgan Stanley. And finally, on December 5th, Managing Credit Portfolios in the Current Volatile Environment panel. And now I'd like to introduce Sim Sagal, Program Director of the ERM Program. Thank you, Josh. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming out. Uh, we have an interesting topic, I think, for you today. Hope you enjoy it. So we're just going to do some quick introductions. Uh, I'll just introduce myself and, and, the, and the panelists. So I'm, I'm Sim Siegel. I'm founder and director of the Master's of Science and Enterprise Risk Management here at Columbia University. I am uh, also a full-time faculty, senior lecturer in discipline. I am also president of Synergy Consulting, which I founded uh, 12 years ago now, focusing exclusively on enterprise risk management. And as you'll know, and I know you all know this, in the School of Professional Studies, that's one of our hallmarks, is that all of the faculty are currently actively in the market, or very recently from the market, to bring you the uh, current uh, and emerging skills. So that's, that's a unique feature of our school. Uh, I'm also the author of a book uh, on enterprise risk management called Corporate Value of Enterprise Risk Management, <laughs> which I uh, wrote for executives to help them advance their ERM programs, but it's since also been adopted as required reading on the syllabi of the Society of Actuaries, which is the world's oldest profession and my chosen profession, and leading universities in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, China, where it's been translated into Chinese, Italy, Croatia, and Egypt, and as I learned not too long ago uh, from a client, also Jamaica. I'm also a former vice president on the Society of Actuaries Board of Directors, where as part of that uh, role, I was the first chair of the risk committee where I led the design implementation of the ERM program that protects the Society of Actuaries, uh, the profession itself, which also uses the, the value-based enterprise risk management uh, technique that I developed, which is what the book is about, and which is the foundation of the master's degree. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and uh, one of uh, 37 people globally initially awarded the Chartered Enterprise Risk Analyst credential for a, a essentially advancing the profession of enterprise risk management. Uh, here is uh, Luna Shua, who I'm uh, very excited to say is Senior ERM Modeling Analyst at Symergy. One of the best things about uh, my role is that I get to cherry pick some of the best talent from our program before it gets into the market and, and hire, hire at Symergy. I, I always say when I introduce Luna to clients that she is, in my opinion, the best, uh, best ERM modeler in the world. So, so that's uh, my opinion. Uh, prior to Symergy, I work in an investment bank and also uh, at a multinational doing risk, uh, risk analysis. Uh, of course, there's a master's degree in enterprise risk management here at Columbia and is a certified FRM. And uh, to her left is uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Rich Lorio is the associate director of, of the program, uh, who uh, is also full-time faculty. Uh, he also is essentially operated as the chief risk officer of Fortune 300 Assurance, where he was recognized by Treasury and Risk Magazine in 2011 as one of the 100 most influential people in finance for his work in implementing the value-based ERM successfully uh, at, at Assurance. He's a member of the SOA Risk Committee for, for many years, a co-editor of Risk and Rewards uh, for, for, for a few years now, an FSA and a CFA. And he's uh, uh, developed, advanced, uh, collaborated in developing new courses all the time, many of our uh, core courses, including co-developing the capstone, inventing and, and developing the insurance risk management course. Uh, the external stakeholders, cognitive bias in ERM, and I probably am missing more that you're always doing. So very, very uh, critical a member that has made the program what it, what it is today. So the topic we have for you today is about risk disclosures. And just to set this up, it's something I've been thinking about and talking about for many years. If you look at what most organizations, uh, I'm just talking SEC regulated, which has the required disclosures in the 10K section 1A, you have to disclose risk factors of, of your, your company. If you look at it, people sometimes ask me, well, who's doing ERM 
it really well. I say it's hard to know because if I've been inside as a consultant, you have to be inside to know. I can't talk about it. And from the outside, you can't tell. Sometimes there's companies that seem like they're not doing that much. But when you go inside, they're doing a lot. And if you look at the disclosures, sometimes it seems like there's a lot of similarities uh, from the outside. The laundry list of all kinds of risks. But when you get inside, you often may see there's a mismatch between what the company is seeing in its ERM program, what it knows, what it's prioritizing, and what it actually discloses. I've always said, I'm not a lawyer, but that's a risk. If something happens to that company, uh, it could be shareholder litigation, asking tough questions. What did you know? And when did you know it? And what did you disclose? And why is this in the, in the way it is? And there's risk there. In fact, I, I'm aware that there was one lawsuit uh, initiated where uh, one, uh, the, the, uh, the, the class action, well, it wasn't actually class action, it was many, many lawsuits against this large organization claiming that there was damage to property. And the company knew it and admitted it. But a nuance in the litigation was they started attacking their ERM program, saying, ooh, maybe your ERM program wasn't good enough. And I think this is really on the threshold. Actually, they declared bankruptcy, so that didn't actually go that way. The, the company is in rehab, so it didn't play out that way. But that idea, I think, is where it might advance practices. At some point, someone's going to successfully sue that there was a gap there, and then all companies are going to ship. But the current guidance from the SEC requires you to have good disclosures in various ways. It's not clear on what it means. So we're gonna take a deeper look at from an enterprise risk management uh, perspective, an advanced perspective, a value-based enterprise risk management perspective. What, is, what does it really mean to satisfy what the SEC wants and go a little bit deeper than that as well? So here's the SEC guidance. We picked out a few uh, factors. And, and so Luna and I are gonna to present to you this research we conducted analyzing uh, some companies' uh, disclosures and share with you some of the results. And then Rich is going to talk about uh, uh, implementation considerations from his from his expertise. So uh, so this is what Luna and I uh, picked out. The SEC says you have to look at the most significant factors. You have to be concise. It has to be organized logically. You have to explain how the risk affects the issuer. And each risk factor should be under a single subcaption. And we'll talk about that. So what we uh, looked at was we uh, created this uh, research study, it's still a work in progress. Uh, we named it uh, ERM Comparative Analysis of Risk Disclosures, because really it's, it's a relative comparison. As, as you'll see, we would like uh, companies to be actually way ahead of where they are, but we have to be realistic about where they are. And we just wanted to, to differentiate and analyze and do a comparative analysis. We, we looked at 40 companies, 10 companies in each of four sectors. We looked at mid-tier banks, technology, retail, and life insurance. And we did a word-by-word -word analysis. And when I say we, that's the royal we. <laughs> most, mostly Luna was on the front lines analyzing virtually, if you look at that, it's almost half a million words, a word-by-word -word detailed analysis trying to interpret what it means in an ERM context. So the criteria, we, we co co uh, coalesced them into three different categories. One, are the disclosures focusing on the important risks? Number two, what is the quality of the description of the risks from an ERM perspective? And three, what is the general quality of the disclosures, just from a general uh, uh, perspective? We'll define each of these in turn, show you what factors we used, and Luna will show you the results uh, from each of these uh, parts. So we're going to do a little bit of a tag team. Uh, she's going to get up, I'll sit down, and then I'll get up, she'll sit down there. When we get to it, we're just explaining, we'll be jumping up and down a little bit between uh, sharing, sharing the presentation. So the first is focusing on important risks. So the characteristics of focusing on this are two characteristics. One is prioritizing by impact to shareholder value. That's supposed to be the perspective of disclosures to, to, to investors and potential investors, right? What is the impact on the value to, to the owners or potential owners? And the second, uh, the second aspect is, are you limiting it to material risks? Or are you just giving a long laundry list so you just pr pretend you're covered, but you're really not giving valuable information to the owners and, and potential owners? So can, we're picking on the word concise. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, after we uh, uh, completed this part of the study, and we're going to go then deeper, the SEC did something pretty cool, which they said, you know, you're not prioritizing enough. So if you're too long, if you have too lengthy of a disclosure, we're going to require 
you to have a one to two page summary. <laughs> so what that means is that when Luna and I looked at this, we're like, oh, that's great. And it's like, oh no, <laughs> we'll have to redo our entire study. You could redo it the whole thing in the new context of, oh, who made the summaries and now do people shorten it? So it's more of a snapshot in time. So this thing will evolve, uh, but we're excited to take that next step uh, down the road. Maybe we'll share that with you as well. So these two characteristics, so let's talk about for a minute, what, what are the source of important risks? And there's a longer uh, uh, discussion on this we're gonna get into now. Every industry study that I've ever seen, including two that I led, which are the first two in the five listed uh, below there, I know you can't see it, but we'll share that with you if anybody wants these slides. And I'm not gonna be dancing to that music. I'll just let that run out. Okay, every industry study I've seen, and, and including those two I, I performed, and all my client work, including for, for financial services, banks, insurance companies, credit cards, all show the same rough relative proportion of importance. When you look at ERM risks, big volatility items, not little nits, not little small things, big items, two thirds in the dark blue come from strategic risk sources. So these are, and we define it this way, strategic risk is maybe your strategy isn't designed perfectly in the choice of products and services with the distribution channels you want to use, the target markets you're going after, with the value proposition that you're proposing. Or maybe your strategy is fine, but you maybe have execution risk on that strategy. And that's usually several risks in the top 20 to 20 to 25 risks of an organization. Or competitor risk, maybe a competitor is going to attack you. Or regulation is going to be changed, it's going to ruin one of your markets. Or supply chain issues, or governance issues, international risk. These are the bulk, two thirds of the volatility. In the light blue is operational. This is people related risk, process related risk, uh, technology related risk, not just cyber, but all technology risks and disasters, both man made, like uh, the Ukraine war and uh, natural disasters like uh, COVID. The last part of the pie is the financial insurance risk, mostly financial. This is market, credit, liquidity, commodity price risk, economic risk. Not that these aren't important, they're tremendously important. But in terms of the sheer number of independent things that can go wrong, when you add it up and look at the contribution of volatility of any organization, including banks, you find this rough proportion, which is kind of interesting. And I know most of you know this, that unfortunately, the financial services companies, which are supposed to be more advanced in ERM, are focusing all or almost all of their quantitative rigor, where? Just in that small gray part of the pie. That's where the rigor is. And there's issues with that rigor too. But uh, then in, in the light blue, they do red, yellow, green, high, medium, or low. And never was an important decision ever based on high, medium, low, red, yellow, green kind of qualitative treatment. And the dark blue is virtually ignored. It's virtually ignored quantitatively. So this is where things should be. And I'm alluding to what you're gonna see in the disclosures. A lot of people have a lack of focus in the proper areas. So we use this as a guide. And Luna will show you how much, when, we, when she analyzed, disclosures of different companies, were they on this mark? Were there risks that they listed when you analyze really what does it mean the way they have their words? How many risks does it map to? And are they in this proportion or do they deviate from that? She'll show you that. Now, the specific factors that we used to interpret this was uh, 1A, 1B, 1C, three. First, uh, whether the uh, by word count, the representation, that means something too, how many words you use, and that's the messaging you're sending out to the market. Uh, by words, how does it map into that strategic operational uh, financial proportion? Or another way is uh, 1B is just, just looking at the, at the actual number of risks, regardless of the, of the words. That's important too, so we wanted to measure that and factor that in. And 1C, we wanted just the word focus, at least in that, that you're not listing 100 risks, that you really do have a material focus, which is meaningful. And we picked a cutoff of 25. So we'll look at that. And now uh, Luna is going to come up and, and share with you uh, some of the results. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. So the first factor here is to see if the company's focus is in appropriate proportion to proper risk categories by word count. So here we define the appropriate proportion by modifying and averaging the data from the four research studies that Sam just mentioned. And the result is the standard uh, percentage is given by the rightmost column. So we calculated the percentage of each risk uh, categories in terms of total meaningful word counts. So the total meaningful word counts means the number of words they use to describe all strategic, operational, and financial risks. 
it differs from total word count because there are words in the risk factor section that do not directly describe strategic, operational, and financial risks. So after we get the percentage for each risk category, we then sum up the, uh, the, sum up the absolute value of deviation from the standard. So as we can see from this table, the best performer here uh, used 66.2% of their words describing strategic risks, which is a 0.5% deviation from the standard. 27.7% of their words are describing operational risks, which is a 0.2% deviation from the standard. And last, 6.1% uh, of words are describing financial risks uh, with only 0.3% deviation from the standard. So if we sum those numbers up, we got the 1% deviation in total. And actually we can see a huge difference between the worst performer and the best performer here. Compared with the best one, the worst one puts too much of their emphasis on financial risks and also, uh, and instead of focusing on their strategic and operational risks. The next factor is analogous to the first one, but instead of focusing on the word counts, this factor focuses on their uh, focus on the percentage of risks they use to describe uh, each risks. And then it's based on like how many uh, risks they mentioned under each risk category in their 10K. And we also calculated the percentage of uh, each risk category in terms of total number uh, of risks they mentioned uh, in their 10K, and then sum up the absolute value of deviation from the standard. So again, this table illustrates the best and the worst results. So we can see the best company deviates like 5% uh, from the standard in the number of strategic risks they mentioned. And then it deviates like 3% uh, from the standard in the number of operational risks they mentioned. And then 2% deviation from the standard in the number of financial risks they mentioned. So the worst performer here basically deviates like too much in their financial and also strategic risks. So you might wonder if the best performer and the worst performer we just mentioned are the same in factor 1A and 1B. Can you take a guess? Actually, uh, they're different. So the worst company is the same, but the best two performers are different companies. But they both did a relatively good job in their focus on correct risk categories based on the word count and also risk count. And they are both from the technology industry. So the third factor here is to see how many risks those companies mentioned in their 10K. And from this graph, we can see the number of risks they mentioned ranges from 26 to 96. Based on past research and experience, the ideal number of key risks in an ERM program is no more than 25. So uh, we believe, and also SEC pointed out in their year 2020 amendments, that most of the companies tend to mention both material and also non-material risks in their 10K. So this could lead to a problem that there's an increase in the length of risk disclosure factor and also the number of risks they mentioned in their 10K. And they do this just to avoid like legal proceedings for neglecting or discounting any risks. And now Sam will introduce our second e-card criterion. Thank you, Lena. So pr pretty frightening how, how different things are, how there's a best and a worst and it differs tremendously. And I think it's interesting, Luna, pointed out that the best are not always the same. So I think it validates that we were looking at both word count and risk count. The second uh, perspective is quality risk description from an ERM perspective. So this is two, uh, two issues we wanted to talk about in terms of defining risk by source. Now we're not talking about, when we say financial category, we're not saying all oh, the things that affect financial, all risks for a corporate entity are affecting financials, right? If it doesn't lower your revenues, increase your expenses and or increase your cost of capital, why do you, you don't care about it? And it's not a risk. We're talking about the source. Most organizations, most doing enterprise risk management, no matter how, what size, have a very confused and muddled understanding of what 
is a risk, how to define it consistently by source. There's uh, often many are defined by source, some are by intermediate impact, and some are defined by impact, which is, causes a lot of problems. Here are the two main problems. One is you don't have the right context uh, for assessing the risk to begin with, and we'll talk about that. And the second is you don't have a complete scenario because you fail to include downstream impacts, and we'll talk about that as well. So to illustrate that, uh, from left to right is the source to intermediate to then outcome. As I mentioned on the outcome on the right, yeah, a risk has got to either lower revenues, increase expenses, and or increase cost of capital so it lowers your value or you don't care about it. But uh, what happens is, and I asked this, and I did this um, at a, a firm, the Association for Federal Enterprise Risk Management, uh, they do an annual uh, meeting. So I, I did a plenary session a few years ago, and one of the comments I made to the group was, there's no such thing as reputation risk. And everybody's like, ooh, like, oh, is Sim supposed to be some kind of an expert in the arm? What you, what's he talking about? I, of course, there's reputational risk. My point was, reputation risk is not a source of risk. There are many different independent risks. It's a matter of degree. They could rise to a level. This is just four examples on the left. They could rise to a level which could trigger the temporary or lasting media coverage, which then can cause temporary or lasting damage to your reputation, which then can cause either lower revenues, uh, higher expenses, or a higher cost of capital and hurt your value. So for example, you may be known for great product quality, true or untrue, there's a story that goes viral that you got bad product quality. Uh, uh, true or untrue, you may have great customer service, there's a, there's a story that you don't. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, you can do different levels of damage and stay there. Uh, or you may have a, a scandal, an internal scandal that, that clings to the brand and lasts. Uh, or you just may have a poor relationship with those with public voices that can damage your reputation. I had one, one a company I was talking to, and they said, look, the governor of our state is out to get us. Every time he gets to the microphone, he tries to bash us. It's just a vendetta. So they have to deal with that reality. It could, you know, Now, how you deal with each of these risks is very different. You have to look at it at the source. And also, how you would assess the likelihood or severity of how these would play out, it matters tremendously as to where it's coming from. So for one company, they might say, yeah, don't care, don't care. Yeah, scandal's a problem. Yeah, that, that one is, is got a, is, is something brewing, you know, uh, with one of the board members, you know, or or uh, or some talk, and or, or we have we know we have an external relations issue. Another company may be the opposite. So you have to get the context right to be able to vote. And also, when you're scoring in the initial qualitative risk assessment, you're trying to funnel and narrow down risks to see out of hundreds what do we focus on, and then you vet them in a in a more rigorous, uh, deterministic, probabilistic scenario analysis. But even in that first qualitative risk assessment where you're asking people to score likelihood and severity, if you're doing reputational risk, you might be asking the group, hey, what, let's say we're all the qualitative risk assessment participants. And we're asking, okay, vote on reputational risk. Well, this group may be thinking of something that comes from poor product quality. That group may be thinking of a scandal. And you're all voting and the numbers are all over the place. Looks like we all disagree. We don't disagree. We're just looking at we're thinking of different versions of what might trigger reputational damage. So that's a big problem. And this is rampant. This is not theory. This is practice. This is what's going on in most organizations. There's a muddling. Uh, another example is ratings downgrade. And I remember there was one uh, client I had, and um, they had actually already done their qualitative risk assessment. But I looked at it, and I could tell there were some risks that were not defined by source. And I knew we were going to have trouble. So I wanted to, they said, no, no, we just want you to, we've done the qualitative, we want you to do the quantitative and then the decision-making move on down the road that way. And I said, well, I really would like to reperform the qualitative risk assessment. They said, no, no, we just did it recently. And I said, okay, I really wanted to do it. So I met with the CEO and the CFO and I said, there's problems because you're not really identifying risk by source and you can't develop scenarios. It's going to be a little iterative. And they said, look, we just did this a year and a half ago. With a, with, a, with a major firm and it went terribly. And they said, if we ask if a company to redo it, they're gonna hang us. So we can't do it. We accept that it's a little iterative and we understand that. One of the first risks that we explored, I saw was rating agency downgrade. Rating agency downgrade is not a source of risk. Here's three examples. The rating agency may not like your strategy. Just, you just picked the wrong strategy. They don't believe in it. And that could lead to a downgrade or Maybe the second one, maybe they love your strategy, but for the last five years, you've been talking to them. You never execute, you never follow through. So it's more management that they're worried about. There's no execution. That's the risk. And they could trigger a downgrade or it could be poor relationship. And there's many case studies of these are people, you know, there's sometimes issues there and there's lack of communication sometimes. 
how you would score these would be very different. How you'd mitigate them would be very different. They have to be treated differently. So the subject matter expert for this client was for the rating agency downgrade was the CEO. And I remember the conversation. We're sitting across at 20 minutes in, he got up, he said, I get it. We got to go back to the drawing board and think about which one or multiple of these three are we worried about and develop each of those separately. So you have to do that to get the context for scoring. What's also true is if you are not, and I apologize, that's uh, that when, when I looked at it, that, that dot was a little bit larger. There's supposed to be a dot right here. So there's an event there that's triggering uh, two, uh, two uh, outcomes. Now imagine that you think you've got the original source of risk, but it's not. You actually have something upstream that is the true risk source. But if you're not identifying it, you're missing that it may lead to another visible dot there that leads to uh, impacts three, four, and five. So you may be underestimating or overestimating because three, four, and five might be offsetting. Either way, you don't have the whole picture. You're not getting the, the, full, uh, the full downstream picture. I'll give you a classic example. What's the first risk people that don't you know, think that much, even people that don't think that much about ERM, if you ask people, what's the biggest risk? What do they say? Market risk, right? And what type? Equity market risk, right? We're all seeing that today, right? Tremendous volatility in the stock market, right? But that's not a source of risk. Most of the time, companies are not talking about that. They're not really intending to think about that because equity markets just don't move on their own. They mostly move in relation to changes in or expectations in changes in the economic scenario. So you have to go more upstream. You have to go to the left. And the, your economists or people in finance, whoever's doing your economic scenarios will, will maybe have seven different future economic scenarios, one of them being what is built into the baseline plan. But then there's variations. They may have seven or nine scenarios each one of those scenarios has a holistic bet on where the stock market's going to go, where interest rates will go, treasury curve, spread curve, what inflation will do, and how it'll affect different parts of the organization's finances. And at the bottom there, unemployment, consumer spendable income, and how the revenues will be impacted on different of your products. Some may be flat, some may go up, many may go down, may, many may shut, some may shut off. Uh, so you have to think that through, and those at the bottom are often ignored. That could have a much bigger impact financially than any zero times zero balance sheet impacts that the first uh, first one does. Another example I like to give is a danger, and many financial services companies do this. Look at stress testing. Now, not stress testing isn't bad by itself, but in isolation, very dangerous. So instead of doing real holistic scenarios, looking at this by source, a real thoughtful, realistic thing. What happens is people may say, oh, interest rate risk. Looking at that in isolation, doing stress tests. So imagine in a company where the CEO goes to the chief risk officer and says, you know, tell me about this, this risk. And the chief risk officer says, okay, if interest rates move this particular way, we lose 100 million of value of the company. Okay, CEO goes back. Next year, that actually happens. The interest rate scenario plays out exactly that way. But instead of 100 million, the company loses 500 million of value. Oh, well, the CEO comes knocking, knock, knock, knock. Chief risk officer, what, did, what happened? And the chief risk officer's explanation is, oh, uh, well, I was doing stress testing. I was giving you the hypothetical, isolated, in a vacuum impact downstream of just that shock. And I was actually pretty right. I neglected to mention that that's very much uh, correlated with an economic scenario that has all these other impacts and it's five times the effect. Well, you're fired. Get out because the CEO, we have to live in the real world. We need real world, holistic, realistic scenarios. So that can be really misleading. So you've got to get upstream and it's tricky to know how far upstream to go so that you get the full, the full uh, scenario. So that's some context for why we feel that's really important. And we developed three different uh, aspects, uh, factors for, for the e-card. One is what is the quality of how well the company's describing the, the risk by their originating source. Second, to be is how, what is the quality of how they describe the impact of that risk on the financials, on the value, and C, uh, the percentage of risk that do the two together well. So let, let's say you described half of your risk really well by source, and then only the other half by, by outcome. You haven't described any risk completely, comprehensively, in a way that you know, value, you know, current uh, uh, owners and future owners can understand it. So we looked at also the percentage of how many risks do you have both uh, really comprehensively described both by source and outcome so people can understand it. And uh, 
now uh, Luna will walk through some of the results. So the first factor here is to see if those companies mentions their risks uh, comprehensively by source. We listed several examples here and I'm not going to read them, but I've already bolded the key phrases. So the first example mentions uh, reputational damage. So as Sam just mentioned, reputational damage is an outcome and it, it did acknowledge that it's an outcome but various sources could lead to that outcome, but this company fails in mentioning them. And also the bottom example is about downgrade of their financial ratings. Again, Sim just mentioned it's an intermediate outcome and this company also fails in mentioning them. The next example is about changes in regulations. But different regulations could have completely different impact on companies. So what exactly is this regulation? It's not clear here. So we don't consider it as a clearly described risk source. And then let's check out our final example here. This one is super clear and specific. It mentions fluctuations in foreign currency exchange rates. So for this example, we say it did a good job in risk source description. So the next factor is to see if those companies describe their risk impact clearly. And if those risk impact description gives the level of detail that we would like to see. We also listed three slightly different uh, examples here, but they all have one single risk source, which is changes in tax laws. So our first example here mentions it could adversely affect our business. It basically says nothing. Of course, it will affect your business. And then the second example here, it could materially reduce our net income. It's better than the first one, but still it's a very general description. And then our last example here means it could have impact on tax rate, impact on income, provisions, and also tax expenses, which gives reader a clear picture of how this change could impact the company's cash flow. So we say it did a good job in this risk impact description. So our purpose of risk description quality from the ERM perspective is not actually to like chase companies down for every detail, but through comparison, we establish how well those companies are doing in describing their risks. So our third factor here is to see the percentage of risks that are comprehensively described by both the source and also the impact. So as we can see from this table, the best performer here basically describe 78% of their risks comprehensively, while the worst one only has like 16% of their risks that are uh, considered clearly defined. And now Sam will introduce our third e-card criterion. Thank you, Luna. The third uh, is just from a general perspective. Is it, is it clear? So how do we describe that? Well, uh, four aspects. One, was it organized well? And, and that comes from the words from the SEC, organized logically, and that each risk factor should be under a single subcaption. Second is just readability, which makes sense. You know, we want things to be easy to comprehend. Third is relevance, that the descriptions should be related to defining the source of the risk or the impact. As Luna pointed out, there's a lot of zero words out there that don't say anything, a lot of filler. And that's meant maybe intentionally disguised, but it definitely does disguise what's going on. And four, brevity. Uh, SEC requires you to be concise, so we wanted that to be a criterion, uh, a criterion as well. Uh, and the factors that we use was uh, quarterly of uh, quality of organization, excuse me, is that the average number of subcaption used to define, uh, to describe a risk. So imagine if you're clear, you should be organized and have, okay, this, this is a subcaption, this risk is completely described here. But some companies just describe a little here, then later on, three pages later, describe a little bit more of that risk and then do somewhere else. It, it's diffused all over the place, very confusing. Not easy for you to get a handle on what's going on. Maybe they don't want you to, maybe they don't have a good handle on it. And I think that maybe some other, just the not understanding how to do this the right way. Uh, the second one is readability. We use the FLESH uh, reading ease score, which is a pretty standard methodology. Uh, 
relevance. So we counted up the percentage of non-zero words. Of course, you want the, the, the percentage to be higher. Uh, uh, and brevity, we, we looked at how efficient you were. So if a company, uh, in, in a, per a thousand words, how many risks are you covering? Four or 17, right? So are you being more efficient and, 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 and more concise? So we, we wanted those four. And um, now, Luna, I went too far. Can't go back. There we go. Luna will describe the results. Thank you. Thank you. So the first factor here is quality of organization. As Sam just mentioned, SEC requires each risk factor to be presented under a subcaption that fully describes the risk. But as we can see from here, the worst company actually mentions like 1.75 times of their risks in their 10K. And a lot of times we see companies mentioning one risk under the subcaption and then several uh, risk source under a different subcaption. So I'm going to give you a more specific example. There's a company mentioning economic risk eight times in their 10K. And you probably don't like it because the same economic risk you just read appears again and again. And you cannot have any additional information from the repetitive words. The second factor here is readability. So uh, we use the flash reading e-score to measure uh, if uh, the readability of the risk factor section. And this score actually indicates how difficult a passage in English is to read, and it gives a score between zero to 100. So a score of zero means the passage is very difficult to read, while a score of 100 means the passage is very easy to read. And as we can see from this table, our samples all fall under the scale of zero to 30, which means they are all very difficult to read and are only best understood by university graduates. So yeah, so, so we could draw the conclusion that the 10K risk factor section is not that reader friendly and to the general public, because ideally the text aimed at the general public audience should be around grade eight to grade 10 level, but apparently it's not the case. Um, yeah, and also, so we could yeah draw this conclusion. They didn't uh, provide a very, reader-friendly context under this 10K risk factor section. The next factor is relevance. So we use the percentage of non-zero words to measure uh, if the company is effectively using words to describe their risks. And our definition for zero words are, like first, words that are used to describe risks, but are too vague to identify the risk source. Let's say the example we had before, the reputational damage, everyone mentioned about it, but what those risks under that reputational damage, we don't know. And then the second criteria would be words that are neither introduction or explanation or the impact analysis of a risk. This usually happens when a company starts to mentioning its past experience using very lengthy paragraphs instead of focusing on the risks in the future. And the last criterion would be words that are just company's notes or are totally unrelated to the risk itself. So from this table, we can see uh, the best performer is effectively using their words to describe risks. While the worst performer here only has like 66% of meaningful words. The last factor here is Gravity. So it aligns with the conciseness requirement of SEC. So we use the number of risks per thousand words to measure the brevity of the risk factor section. And we can see here the best performer mentions like 10 risks per thousand words, while the worst one is only able to mention two to three risks per thousand words. So that's all for our analysis and selected results for each E card factor. And now Sam will share some more results with you guys. Thank you, Lena. So we have uh, an overall scorecard. And this is all calibrated, so it's it's all just relative is more important. We wanted to give a spread. You can see uh, very few are very good at this in, in our view. Uh, there's a lot in the middle there. 
and there's some that are quite quite poor at it. And it was kind of interesting which companies uh, were in different categories. But another way to look at it is by sector, and there's you know some clumping, and but uh, the, you can see the retail sector did best, and and the life insurance sector did worse. Uh, Mid-tier banks and, and technology right around the same B minus uh, scorecard. And uh, if you look at the grades by sector and factor, a couple of interesting points. The technology sector did best in terms of focusing uh, on the important risks. The uh, life insurance sector did best in terms of the quality of the description from an ERM perspective. And uh, the, uh, both the mid-tier banks and the technology sector tied for uh, being best in uh, the quality of description from a general perspective. So it really is some interesting differences there. And this is just a list of all the companies. You can see there's a lot of variability uh, in there. Um, I think that that's the comments we had for you, but we, we, we debated a lot as to whether to reveal the names of the companies. We felt that uh, at this point, it's, you know, where it's a work in progress with the change in the SEC, we probably want to redo it. As you can see, the, the heavy lifting that Luna did, a half a million words is no small task to, to go real detailed. It took an enormous amount of time and energy. We think there's some value in showing you this. Uh, at some point down the road, we might be able to reperform it on a larger scale, um, something that we might, we might pick up at Columbia to do research, and we've talked about that possibility. Uh, but if anybody has interest in this, uh, we're certainly happy to discuss afterwards. Uh, but we think that we'd like to see companies get better at this. And we think like most research studies, we may you know, publish something once we're finally done that's more public, that doesn't reveal the names, but for individual companies that want uh, specific analysis will reveal uh, you know, their competitors and, and theirs and benchmark it to help them get better and move, it, move ahead. So that's the comments that, that we had. Uh, now we're gonna try to pass it over to Rich and Luna and I will be seated. Uh, Rich will walk us through some implementation considerations. Okay, um, good afternoon. So you've seen all the hardcore analysis and the numbers. So I'm gonna to try to take you to a level more up at the 40,000 foot level. Um, given my prior role as a quasi CRO um, at a Fortune 300 insurance company. And just what's, also, what's helpful sometimes is to give you context from where I came from, right? Um, so the company that I worked for um, went IPO. They were, they were under a, uh, a Belgian Dutch conglomerate were kind of fat and happy for a number of years, and then they went IPO, right? They were um, spun off, so to speak, and they became a, a public company. And it's a big challenge for companies to suddenly have to produce all these different forms, whether it's a 10K, all, the, all these other things, right, that you have to do as a public company. And it's hard to be a good public gap company. And when you're first becoming a public gap company, US gap especially, um, one of the biggest issues is, okay, you don't have a lot of time to do stuff. So what do you do? You copy from your peers. So anybody else or where you can, you try to take it and then you massage it into what you have. So the reason I'm telling you all this is because the company I worked for went IPO in 2004. We began our, our, our value-based ERM journey, for which for some bizarre reason, I got some sort of muckety-muck award for in 2011. We, we started that process in, what was the first go around? Like 2007, 2000, it was around the financial crisis. We began that journey, okay? So here's a problem, right? Anytime that you already have something in place, the question becomes, why change it? Why should you change it? And it's even worse in a way for the risk management folks. And this would have been the case whether there was already something there or not. And it's because the risk management team does not own the actual risk disclosures in the 10K. That may be a shock to you. I mean, that, that's just wrong, right? Why would that be? And that's because the, whoops, there we go. Because the risk disclosures are part of an overall document. 
called the 10K or the 10Q. It's just one section. It's an incredibly important section. I think it is underrated by a lot of investors, in my opinion. But it's a very important section. As you can see here, there's a lot of information, and they're not, and it's not being disclosed well. But the reason it's not being disclosed well, to, to some degree, and I don't want to, and I'm going to sound like I'm going into blame game here, but part of it is because it's part of an overall document process that's owned by our friends in legal. So now I want to make sure that I don't offend any of the lawyers in the crowd, okay? Because we do have some distinguished lawyers who've graduated from the program and who are, are some of the best risk managers. I mean, if you want to make sure you're not going afoul with some idea or some acquisition or some sort of capital structure, you want to have a lawyer in the room. So I want to make that very clear. I am not putting down my legal friends, okay? But remember, the slide that Luna had referred to with regards to readability. What was the score of even the best, the most readable one was 27. In the bottom, it was, you, need to, you need to be a university graduate, right? No wonder nobody reads these risk factors. I mean, you need, you need a college degree at the very least to read them, okay? And there's a reason for that, okay? And it's because they are largely constructed by, by the legal team. So there is language in there that's called legal ease. And I'm not referring to the bar in, in the She-Hulk series, if you know what I'm talking about. So oh, I got a couple, I got a couple of laughs. So I'm not the only Marvel nerd in here. Okay. Um, legal ease is a very specific language, right? So that's what makes it challenging. And that's why there's a lot of wording. That's why some, it was, it's like shocking to see some of the statistics where you actually need 500 words in some cases to describe a risk. Really? 500 words. It's amazing. So some of it is because it is, it is a process and the, and the risk disclosures are part of an overarching process. And what I found I had to do was once we got things up and running as far as all of our different, our, our qualitative risk assessments, our failure modes and effects analysis interviews, our models, our, our results, our charting, we then had the challenge of getting into the loop of reviewing the risk disclosures. And the fact is that we weren't the only ones doing it because Everybody wants to have a say in the overall document, including the risk disclosure. So it's very important that you make sure that you're there as, a, as, as the leader of the ERM team at the right time to make sure that the right stuff is being said. Okay, so there's a number of different layers and, there's, and there are timing issues because remember these, these documents have to be produced at certain times to be timely for investors. So, that's something that needs to be considered the overall governance. So then the question becomes, well, then what do you use? And this is actually in some ways the easiest part, okay? Provided that you have a robust ERM framework. If you do, and the big if, in many cases, I hate to tell you this, it's a big if, but if you do, then you've got a number of places to draw from. First of all, you've got either qualitative risk assessments or some type of RCSA that you can, you can point to, right? I would suggest you don't want to stop there. And to, the and to the degree that you've done good quantification or that you at least have scenarios fleshed out in robust detail, I would suggest you use those. And really where the scenarios come into play is in terms of providing some pertinent details that you may or may not want to include, but you want to at least consider them in terms of ranking, ranking the risks accordingly and making sure that you're only including the risks that really matter, okay? So all of this can be very, very helpful. And certainly the modeling, right? Looking at both likelihood as well as impacts to key metrics I recommend the value metric, but there, are, there may be other ones that you may want to consider, whether it's an impact to the balance sheet or an impact to earnings or something to that effect. You'll want to consider that in terms of, again, the overall ranking. I am not suggesting in any way, shape, or form 
that you take your modeling results and, and open the kimono to the public. I'm not suggesting that in the least, but I am suggesting it should be there to inform on the most important risks so that investors can know, all right, what is management really concerned about? Because it should link up with management actions, right? So you've got the information there. And then certainly any controls that you have in place, one of the things that I very rarely see is any discussion of controls, okay? And it's shocking because companies are thinking about risk all the time. Even if it's not a formal ERM program, they're thinking about it. So why not have some sort of discussion about what you're doing? You can do this, and I'm gonna to get to the counterpoint for maybe not doing it. You can do this without giving away shop secrets, okay? So, and this is a big challenge, right? So um, a lot of times I talk to students initially about how the value-based approach can lead to better disclosures and they wanna show everything and God bless their souls. They wanna be transparent. It's wonderful, okay? However, I can tell you this from experience, <laughs> all right? Um, I've had a number of arm wrestling, well, not, not literally, but it felt like arm wrestling with people in heads of business units, with people in um, certain key functions like cyber, head of or, or CISO, about how much do you wanna talk about, right? And just, and just in full disclosure, right? So this is to be fair to our students, I always want to disclose more. I always feel, I always try to push, I always try to push the envelope. But one thing I learned very quickly is that you don't want your ERM program to be a source of risk because you're saying things that you don't need to say that are giving your competitors an edge. So there's always a balance in being able to, in, 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 in finding that, that sweet spot. But to Sim's earlier point, Sim's earlier point, I think, not disclosing enough is just as big, if not a bigger risk. And certainly the way that a lot of these companies are disclosing risks, which are these tangled messes, all right? And that's one of the things we go through in the capstone. So I see a few of my, my students, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We just went through that, that exercise. There are a lot, there's a lot of messy 10Ks. And at some point there is going to be litigation that will at least in part be related to really poor disclosures about that miss on just obvious risks. So there's a whole bunch of things that you won't want to put in there, like your, you know, whatever certain contract terms. There's no need to say that per se. You don't need to show customer lists, all right? You don't, you don't want to. Like if, if you have a big renewal, okay, big debate we had were contract renewals for some of, uh, some of our biggest clients in the property industry, okay? And, you know, folks were adamant, no, do not include names. Do not start saying who is coming up for renewal in the next six months. That's a bad idea because then our competitors are going to know that they can swoop in, right? And by the way, they probably knew anyway because everybody is tracking everybody else and staying in touch with customers they don't have. But you don't want to give anybody a leg up. There's no point. Right, so there is really a, a balance that needs to be struck here. Oops, here we go. Now, emerging risks. So one of the things, so, so there's two things out of this. One is you wanna make sure that you have a nice tidy list of risks, but it doesn't mean that you forget about the rest. So one of the things you wanna make sure of is that you've got a good handle on what could occur things that are kind of percolating under the surface. And as new risks come to the surface, you have really two, effectively two choices. One, you can wait to the next quarter. You can wait until either the 10Q or if it's the, if it just happens to fall on your annual cycle, then your 10K and you can wait and then update your disclosures. And that's, that can be okay. Um, if you don't think it's that significant, then you can do that. But if you're not sure, 
There is another tool, and in fact, it's really highly encouraged. And I would say, if you're in doubt, you should use an 8K to disclose a material change in your risk. 8Ks are frequently used with things like significant acquisitions or divestitures or international expansions. Well, these are all, these are all very, these are risk-oriented decisions. So therefore I would say whatever risks are changing as a result of these new initiatives should be encapsulated in your 8K disclosure. One other point I'll make here on emerging risks, and this is a little bit dated, but because I think most companies are now getting it right, but initially COVID-19 was really messy because no one knew what the heck was going on. So one of the things with something that is as systemic a risk as COVID is, is that you wanna make sure that um, you've, you're, you're, you've really got an ERM focus, right? That all the different functions, all the different affected businesses, and sometimes you don't even realize what businesses are being affected until some time goes down the road. So this is where, again, it, it's, it's a tricky balance, right? You wanna be able to say enough, but you, you wanna make sure you're being accurate, um, but you also wanna make sure that you're being thorough as well. Whoops. Okay. Now, some companies, not, now I, I've, I've talked about the 10K, 10Q, the, the, um, the mandatory, and I've also talked about the 8K you're not necessarily limited to that world, okay? You don't have to go through all of that. If there is a specific important risk to a company that is evolving, that's changing, and that your investors in particular care about, then, God bless you, then you should consider maybe doing, you could do an 8K if you want to, but I mean, you don't always want to go through the morass of doing that and filing it. You may just want to do a disclosure in general. Example, at, in my prior life, one of the most significant risks to the company was the risk of a significant hurricane season because of the exposure of the company um, to property damage along the mostly Southeast coast, mostly Florida, a lot of Florida business, a lot of Texas business, and so forth. So a lot of exposure there. And so the company recognized years ago, many, many years ago, that it needed a reinsurance program for it, a catastrophic reinsurance program. But the questions would always come up from investors such as, well, what does your program cover? And what happens if there are two storms? What if there's a, a category three, that's a, a billion dollar storm, um, versus a you know a category one that might be smaller what what happens how much in claims do you wind up retaining right so we would go through this song and dance all the time with them and after a while we realized wait a minute wait a minute why don't we just every time we renew our program because it was evolving our exposure was evolving and our program was changing as new vehicles came online. There were things like cat bonds. For those of you who don't know, that's effectively a bond that's connected to a, a, a catastrophic event that investors provide the, the underlying collateral for. So there are all these other things, there were sidecars, all these things that we were exploring uh, and, we, and it was making things more complicated. So we just said, hey, look, when we get our program in place each year, which is usually around May, why don't we just do a full description of what we did? So that's what we would do. And on top of it, we would provide some, some basic features. So how much we paid for the program, some of the essential things around first event, second event, and those kinds of, 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 of things. And then we would also provide a bunch of what ifs, right? So what if the hurricane season which usually starts in like June or late, late June. And uh, who knows, it goes, it goes through now, even early December. I think, I think Sandy, which happened, Sandy happened like 10 years ago. I think Sandy happened maybe even, it's been a while. I, I, the, years, the years roll by. So Sandy actually happened on Halloween. Right? That was a major storm up here in the Northeast. Um, but anyway, 
The point is, we would put together a whole bunch of scenarios of what could happen and how much we would collect versus how much we'd retain in claims, and that would be useful for investors. So this is just one kind of long drawn out example. You can do this certainly if you're at an iBank and you've got exposure to um, a, maybe a, a, a particular currency, whether it's the US dollar or some other currency, or you may have exposure, you may have interest rate exposure in some way, or you may have credit exposure. You can also use a special disclosure if it's really material and your investors care about it. Investors received our reinsurance updates very, very well. It was, it was applauded in terms of how much it helped. So the last thing I'll just leave you with, it kind of builds its segues, is talk to the investors, right? Because that's who the disclosures are for. If they're not finding them useful, find out why. Find out what they think is missing. And I'll say this. Keep in touch with your investor relations people. They're very, very critical. They're, they're a great source of what's going on, what shareholders are worried about, because they're the ones who are, are fielding all the questions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're the ones who are dealing with all the follow-up after the earnings calls with management. So you want to, where you can, I always enjoyed, well, enjoyed maybe maybe a strong word, but I always found useful to listen in on the earnings calls. Because I wanted to hear, and not because of the scripts, because my God, the, the scripts, I, I can't stand scripts, all right? It's like, oh my God, I can't. Stand. But I love the Q&A because that's where you get the meaty information. That's where you find out what investors are concerned about. That's where the rubber hits the road. So, you know, being part of those calls, or if you can't be on the call getting the transcript, and then any follow-up with the IR department can be very, very useful. And where you can, you wanna be part of your company's investor day or look into what is being addressed in investor day and have risk be part of that conversation.